Welcome to the Analytics Engineering Podcast, featuring conversations with practitioners inventing the future of analytics engineering. On this episode, we sit down with Amit Prakash, who's the co-founder and CTO of ThoughtSpot. ThoughtSpot is a search and AI-driven analytics platform that services some of the largest companies in the world. Together, we learn more about the role of AI in data work, what unique complexity the largest enterprises have when dealing with data, and how more people are becoming data people. I love this episode because Amit brings a totally different perspective from other guests we've had on the show. I'm laughing because I thought we were going to end up talking about metrics. In fact, Ahmed and I connected for the first time after one of his substacks where he outlined a ton of information about metrics. And obviously it's top of mind for us with some of the product development work I have going on. But we started talking about AI and how a search interface can create so much more accessibility for data exploration for more humans. And as longtime listeners know, there is no topic closer to my heart than democratizing data analysis. So we went there. It, maybe we'll just have to have him on again at some point. Yeah, we'll save metrics for another show, but (laughs) this was a fun one. So without further ado, let's get into it. Amit, thanks so much for joining us on the podcast today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me and congratulations on the big raise. (laughs) Thanks. We started our conversation, I don't know, a couple months ago in our respective sub stacks. And okay, I know you have a Substack, great, but you've done something that only real OG thought leaders have done. You have a book and it's called Elements of Programming Interviews, The Insider's Guide. And I did some research. It has a 4.6 star average rating on Amazon. Of course, the thing I wanted to know was I wanted to check out the contrarian view. What did the one star reviewers have to say? And I don't know. I don't know if you've read these reviews yet, but my favorite review, the spiciest review was, this book has great content, but the quality of the binding is really poor. (laughs) <laughs> so I don't know if you want to take this opportunity to respond to that comment. I know that's it's vicious. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> what a starter. So actually, one of my school buddies called me recently and told me this, that the, the printer that we use in India is doing a poor job. And uh, seriously, I, I have, yeah, yeah. Huh. So, so this book has different printers in different places. So huh. Most of the time, it's actually Amazon's printing press. But I suspect that this review is coming from someone who obtained a copy in India. Gosh. And I, I do need to go and uh, rectify that. So thank you. This, for was, this was supposed to be a total throwaway comment just to get us started. And you had actually a, a substantive response. <laughs> okay, let's get to real stuff. It's hard to miss the trajectory in your career. I'm going to review it here in three big steps. You, I think, started your career at a company called Microsoft, where you made a product called Bing. And apparently you worked on the actual like search algorithms there. Then you, you moved to a company called Google, and you worked on search algorithms at Google. And then you founded a company called ThoughtSpot based on search. What is it about search? Why do you keep doing this whole search thing? <laughs> so I'll tell you a little bit of backstory here. So when I landed in us it was to do a phd and uh, I, my advisor used to work in uh, logic census and formal verification which is essentially how do you make sure that the, how do you optimize hardware and how do you make it uh, make sure that it's formally verified and it doesn't have bugs and when i landed he told me that you know this space is not going anywhere there's not investment not much investment happening here's a paper by two guys named Larry and Sergey, why didn't you read it and uh, we'll work on it. And so I spent the summer working on it and I came back to him and said, this stuff is so boring. (laughs) I just don't want to work on this. (laughs) So, so, so we ended up with a completely different thing, which is we ended up working on networking and I was finishing up my PhD and, um, I was thinking that, uh, before I go and be a professor somewhere, I should spend some time in industry to learn a little bit about what are good, nice, practical, juicy problems to work on in research. And I was looking for basically places where they were starting something big from scratch so that I could get in early stage and solve some interesting problems. And uh, 
through a friend, I got connected to the people who were just starting the big team and I ended up joining there and, and just found it to be enormous fun and source of really, really interesting computer science problems and kind of never look back. Hmm. Okay, here's my last kind of intro question for you. I think that it is possible that ThoughtSpot has more co-founders than any other company in data. <laughs> I actually, to verify this, I went to Databricks's Crunchbase page and Databricks has seven co-founders, but it looks like ThoughtSpot has eight. Did all eight of you work together somewhere? How did this come to be? Can you tell us the founding story? Yeah, yeah. So there's seven of us. And okay. uh, what happened was me and Ajit met sometime in February of 2012. And uh, we were looking for you know, interesting problems to work on where we could bring our expertise. And there was a view of there, there in the sense that there was already an industry and people valued the problem that we worked on. And this is how we ended up working on ThoughtSpot to essentially make analytics substantially easier than what it was. And we founded the company in May. And what we realized was that we had taken an enormous challenge upon us. We needed to build a lot of technology and we really needed a really strong engineering team. And uh, so, so we started scouring our network and uh, we found these five amazing people who were really kind of at the top of what they were doing in their own field. And uh, we managed to convince them to come and join us. And after a few months of working with them, we felt that this was such an enormous team and they were adding so much value that it didn't make any sense to kind of keep the difference between us and them. And hmm. So hmm. we expanded the co-founding team to all seven of us. Got it. That's great. The story of every initial conditions for a startup is always so different. It sounds like you actually didn't have these, you know, if you go and ask a venture capitalist, like what is the way to know that co-founders are going to work together really well? It's like, well, they worked together at their last company. They, they've like worked together for years. But it sounds like yeah. a lot of you folks, your first work experience together was on the job. Yeah. I have to imagine that there's a tremendous, not, not only are you like trying to build something together, but you're trying to like build your relationships as a team. That is a non-trivial challenge to work on both of those things at the same time. Yeah, we. this is like, if I were to say one thing that really worked out for us was we found really amazing people in the beginning. And not just in terms of being technically good at writing software or building systems, but really amazing human beings. And um, some of us shared some background. So the three of us went to the same undergrad college and um, uh, me and Shashank went to graduate school together. So we had some relationships, but yeah, the team is probably the thing that I'm most proud of at ThoughtSpot. Sounds like ThoughtSpot was very much a continuation of your search work, it's still a big part of what you do at ThoughtSpot. But maybe for our listeners who might have not had first year zero experience with the products that you're building today, yeah. what was the vision for the company when you decided to found ThoughtSpot and how has it evolved? You're now coming up almost on 10 years of, yeah. of working on the company. Yeah. So when you're we getting started, um, we looked at the market and what we saw, and not much has changed actually, is that when you talk to data teams, they're inundated with these ad hoc requests for data and analytics. And these things don't add too much value to in long term. It's just point in time requests and they keep adding and accumulating. And that keeps the data teams away from doing real meaningful work. And if you talk to any of the execution teams, most of the people don't really engage with data in a meaningful way. Um, beyond what's there in a static dashboard. They're not kind of asking the why questions. They're not asking, how can I improve what I do by leveraging data? They're just kind of looking at dashboard periodically and saying, yep, things are good, things are bad, something like that, right? And, and so we wanted to solve both of these problems where you can truly get the entire company to be data-driven. And when I mean the entire company, it goes all the way from CEO to, you know, frontline merchandiser or a frontline customer success person, all the way to even customers in some cases, um, to truly have access to data and be able to ask their questions and get answers. So, so that was the vision. The way we solved it, I think it's kind of a unique combination of UX, AI, and system design to build something that A, can really operate on granular data and not require a lot of different 
data sets being created from the same data to feed different requests. And on the front end side, build something that looks and feels like Google, but yet on the back end side is completely governed by the data teams and gives you precise answers to precise questions. And it's intuitive and easy to use. So it sounds like a lot of the innovation was really on the consumption piece where any kind of background, whether you have data skills or not, you can now get unique insights and move from just the passive consumption to active using data as a tool for you to make decisions and fold it into your everyday work. Yes. I think that's so interesting. Like every BI tool has a point of view. Or maybe just every good BI tool has a point of view because you can't separate the tool itself from its beliefs about how the work should be done. And, you know, you could go from one to the next to the next and talk about like what the effective points of view are. Maybe we'll get to this. Maybe it's useful to talk about now, but how do you measure the success at doing the thing that you're describing? Like in order for the thing that you're describing to come to pass, it doesn't just involve installing a product. Like you're describing teams should work differently with data. Organizations should literally act differently, which is a big ask. It's non-trivial. Yeah, that has been part of the challenge that it's not just like you present with a tool and everything magically works. There has to be real adoption. There has to be a real intent from the organization to change the way they work. And we've seen this in some of the smallest companies to some of the largest companies where you truly need someone to be championing this cause. One of the earliest successes for us was when we made our very first press release after having Series A raised, we got a call from a guy named Alok Shippuri who used to work at Walmart Labs. His question was, you're claiming all this, can you really do it? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, sure, we'll show up whenever you ask and we'll show you. And um, we kind of went there, loaded a bunch of data into our system and started showing you. He, he kind of turned into a believer. And the problem they were trying to solve was they're saying that it takes too long for the merchandisers who make pricing and promotion decisions to come to any sort of data-driven conclusion and they meet once a month. In this modern world, when they're competing with the you know, digital natives, it needs to shrink so that they can make early decisions. And, and so, so the measure of success for us in that case was really that the decision cycles that used to take a month got went down from a month to basically hourly decision cycles. And it's the kind of thing that's hard to measure at scale. So the, the simple answer to your question is we mostly track adoption yeah. that are the non-technical users using the thing or not. But if you dive deeper into each of these things, it's, it's essentially about did we meaningfully shrink the decision cycle or did we meaningfully unearth strategies or um, you know, point in time executions that made a big difference to the company. And do data practitioners also spend a lot of time in ThoughtSpot? Because I, I often think about data platforms are often built for like one or two main personas. And so it sounds a lot like ThoughtSpot does really well in bringing the like long tail of whatever your background is or comfort with data. We're going to elevate your ability to do data work. And I really mean like the insight work. But what yeah, about like the yeah. data prep work? Does ThoughtSpot help there too? No, I think this is why we love to partner with companies like you because for this kind of thing to work the data absolutely needs to be something that you can trust mm -hmm. and the data teams need to build a data model on top of it that makes sense and in many ways they have to do all the engineering work but they also have to think like a product manager the data model that they're exporting to these thousands of people is essentially at the end of the day a product that needs to be consumed and so you have to have the user empathy to think about Am I overwhelming my user or am I giving them just the right things? Whatever I'm naming, whatever descriptions I'm giving, would it make sense to them or not? Even think about what's blocking adoption and what yeah. can I do to improve adoption? So that's the kind of thing that data teams end up doing a lot. I want to talk a little bit then about the overlap of data and AI. Because I think one of the things that AI has is a lot of, you need a lot of context to be able to give the right kinds of insights. You know, you have to have feedback cycles and learn. AI gets smarter as it continues to work with people. Data prep or data work is often extremely precise. Like you talk to a data analyst and you say, I'd like active users. 
there's like a million follow-up questions of precisely what do you mean by that? Or you're really getting into this sequel work of it being extremely procedural about how you can make conclusions and draw insights. With AI, there's not so much procedures in place, but you take this somewhat of a black box model and have inputs and make suggestions. Where's the overlap in your mind between AI work and data work in the data consumption space? Definitely on the modeling side, you mostly want humans to do the right thing. On the consumption side, I think there's a lot of merit in AI, human in the loop AI, essentially. Right. So you don't want AI to kind of run wild on its own because it's like you said, it's a black box that's not explainable. And most importantly, no matter how much advances have happened in AI, it's really hard to teach an AI algorithm to learn the business context and the business meaning of data. Right. So what we like to do is um, th th there's kind of two places where we found AI to be super useful. And the first one is more like how Google uses AI, right? So the example I like to give is that if you go and search for pain in the bottom of my foot, the first result is going to be plantar fasciitis, right? And, and how does Google get to know when it's not just one example, but millions of such examples where Google knows just exactly the right thing to surface so that when you see it, then you know, yeah, that's the thing I needed. And the answer is really Google is learning this from all of us. We are the ones making Google smart because somebody knew plantar fasciitis means foot in the bottom of my pain, sorry, pain in the bottom of my foot. And uh, they, they probably searched for pain in the bottom of my foot and then subsequently searched for plantar fasciitis and got some good results and spent time on it. And that told Google that this is a good thing to surface. And if enough of the people do it, then Google gets smarter. So the same kind of thing happens in our search where we're building a machine learning model that's personalized to you, but it's learning from everybody else. So if someone asks a question like, how much revenue did we have this quarter? When you're counting the revenue from different Salesforce opportunities, you care about the close date being in this month, right? Or this quarter. Uh, but if someone asks the question, what's the total pipeline created this quarter. Now you're counting the same opportunities, but you're looking at the creation date for each opportunity. And this is the kind of thing that if you ask a novice user, they might miss, but if the right recommendation is in front of them, then they'll know that this is what they needed to do. And so, so this is one place where we found AI to be super powerful. Are you actually talking about like a natural language interface where I can ask questions in English and get answers of my data? Or is there they're more of like an exploratory interface with clicking buttons and visually navigating through data? Yeah. So, so th this brings me to a question that kind of I spent last three, four years of my life, or maybe the entire 10 years, <laughs> <laughs> exploring and really going deep, going to the deep end. So I don't think that despite all the advances in you know, GPT and uh, GPT-3 and T5 and stuff, the natural language stuff is ready to be applied in the data space in a way that you just ask the question and get back the answer. Mm -hmm. Like I was talking to one of the airlines and they had this set of metrics. A0 means average arrival time, uh, average arrival delay for a flight. And D0 means average departure delay for a flight. And they want to ask, what's the A0 for DFW or what's the D0 for DFW? Now, in these two questions, the meaning of DFW changes because A0 means that it's the arrival airport mm. that's DFW and D0 means the departure airport that's DFW. In, in each of these decisions, you can kind of do it with 90% accuracy with machine learning. But when a question requires five of these to be resolved, then your accuracy goes down. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason what we have done is we build an engine that looks and feels like natural language, but it's actually almost like a compiler. Um, so, so you ask precise questions, you get back precise answers. And the trick lies in um, essentially UX and a little bit of machine learning to make it feel like Google, right? So when, let's, let's say if you ask question, active users um, in Texas, 
Now, Texas in your data could have different meanings. It could mean that the user lives in Texas. It could mean that, um, you know, the last shipment that they got was addressed to Texas or a bunch of other things, right? Um, what we will do is that we'll interrupt the user right there and interrupt them and ask them that, like, which Texas do you need? Here are the options. Mm. So, so you can type in the search bar as if you're typing in Google, but every time there's an ambiguity, we'll stop the user there and give them the right set of options. Also recommend the one that makes the most sense in that context, but let them build a precise question. You just listed something that's certainly hard about natural language and data. I never feel more like an old person than when I'm interacting with an Alexa device. <laughs> I don't own any Alexa devices. My in-laws have one. And every once in a while, I try to get it to do something. And I find it very disconcerting that I don't know what the options are. Yeah, There's no like menu. There's no nothing in front of me that I can know what my choices are. And for all of the challenges around the kind of traditional drag and drop interface that a million different products have, it gives you a menu to choose from. Do you have a way of showing people, rather than just like dumping them on a blank page and saying like, go to town, do you have a, a way to expose that type of stuff? Yeah. So there, there are two ways in which the users interact. So, so there's the pure... Google-like search experience. And there, what we do is that your entire data model is sitting in the left panel. Think of almost like um, when you're in an IDE, the left panel kind of gives mm. you all the variables mm. and class names you have, or sometimes all the file names you have, right? Um, so, so it's the same kind of thing that you can have. And you can, if you don't like typing, you can just go double click on mm. the revenue and sales and things like that, right? Um, but then the next question is, why is any different? Why is that any different than just dragging it versus double clicking it? Right. And, and the, the reason it's easier is because we take away a lot of, um, overhead, intellectual overhead and in formulating the question for you by a combination of things. So for example, if you say Texas, you don't need to know Texas is sitting in some customer table and the customer state column or maybe the customer ID links to a geo table and then from there Texas lives there. We we've kind of indexed everything and we already know what possible meaning of Texas in this context is going to be. And the other thing is that you talked about options, right? So, so there's a auto completion engine in which a lot of smarts go that's trying to give the most likely five options that you're going to be interested in. So if you just click on the blank search bar the auto completion engine is probably going to give you like three most popular metrics and two most popular attributes that people have been asking questions about and you kind of go on from there. The other place where this becomes super useful is, and this is something that um, sometimes our messaging is a little bit confusing. We have, we have renamed what, so what most people call dashboards, we used to call them pen board and we've renamed it to be live boards and people say, what's the difference? <laughs> Why are you just kind of taking a familiar paradigm and calling it something else? And the reason for that is that when people design Natch food, someone has to really think through all the different paths the user is going to take. What kind of filters I'm going to allow on top of it? Um, what kind of drill downs I'm going to allow and things like that. The, the way these things are designed is that there's kind of a, uh, everything is backed by a search and there's a transitive closure of kind of going from one search to the other, to the other. So from every, like if you're looking at a chart, let's say it's your monthly active users, um, right? So, so every point you can do whatever you can think of in terms of its neighborhood and just get to another search through a UI. And that's the one that really takes away that fear of blank screen because mm. now you're in the zone, now you're in the context and you're being suggested all sort of neighboring questions right there in the context and then you can go from there. So you've described like a couple of ways that AI can play a really big role in data work. One is discoverability search yeah. and two is auto feeding this experience so that users can explore their data as opposed to yeah. having to have pre-confined parameters for ways you can search and understand the data. One thing I'm really interested about is a lot of data work has these like you need a hypothesis first and mm -hmm. then you get the answer. 
yeah. how do you solve for the problem where you know maybe I I can see a, a live board or dashboard where my user signups are down and I say huh on Tuesday we had not as many signups as I expected but I have no yeah. smoking gun for why that is is it possible to get the insight of like oh well actually our website was down on Tuesday at 2 p.m. and that's why my signups were down yeah. so auto surfacing those correlations is that a very, very hard problem to solve in AI and data. Do you think it's possible for computers to do it better than humans can in creating these hypotheses? So I don't think you can fully automate these things, but AI can help a lot. So, so again, I come back to my thesis around um, human in the loop. AI is the most powerful thing to essentially elevate people to where they can have a meaningful discourse with data. So this particular example, what we end up doing is say, okay, you're seeing two points that should have been close together, but they're far apart. You just select those two points and let our AI engine rip. And what it's going to do is seeing that any human being will do, say, okay, I'm going to compare these two points along all the dimensions that I know of to be interesting. So maybe I'll see how does it split by geo and different, so if my Monday and Tuesday activations, how do they compare? How do, how is it? split by different referral sources or how is it split by different data centers that my users are hitting it in. And if it finds some statistical anomaly that says that, okay, th this data center used to bring, you know, 20% of new user and on Tuesday it brought zero or maybe 1%, that means that the data center was down most likely or something was going wrong. Or, or maybe if you split it hourly and that hour has a statistical anomaly, then it can surface. Now, what happens when you do this is that the algorithms are relatively dumb. They don't really understand the business meaning of it. All they see is a statistical anomaly. And this is where the human needs to come in mm -hmm. and say, hi, huh, this is the one that makes a lot of sense. But what we did was we saved you a ton of time and stress by like in the next 10, 20 seconds, bring all the possible hypotheses in front of you. So this is again, something very close to my heart, spent a lot of time working on it. One of the things that tends to work in the space is, again, learning from the wisdom of the crowd. So th the same algorithm that's suggesting you questions to ask in the auto completion is actually guiding the exploration in this case. It's saying that when people talk about active users, mm. they tend to split this number by state, by you know activation time, by data center or by referral sources. So that's what I'm going to do because I've learned from all these humans who've done this in the past. Now, if the humans haven't done it, then this guy is somewhat clueless. And then you might be able to intervene and direct the exploration in a different direction. And then it will learn for future. I have kind of a meta question on that. So yes, maybe a lot of the data work within an organization might be the same where it's like, oh, we all at DBT Labs have this shared idea or around revenue or that we care about. And we're going to ask similar questions. Do you think there's a lot of transfer learning like across companies where you could get <laughs> everyone thinks there's some unique snowflake when it comes to doing data work, but really like we all have the same questions and there's an ability to have an even stronger recommendation or insight engine if you could transfer learn across customers? I definitely think there's potential. So far, we've been staying, sort of keeping this thing five feet away. Because we don't want to ever get into a situation where a customer feels like we took their data and gave it to somebody else that was potentially their competition. Um, so we don't allow any leakage of data from one customer to the other. And the downside is, of course, that then when you, when you have a cold start problem, somebody needs to come in and teach the system either through some backend interface dumping data or by just experts using the system a little bit to warm it up. But Actually, just yesterday, someone brought it up to me. So what's, um, one of the new things that we're doing is trying to build these um, vertical spot apps where we know that this is a data model that everybody is going to be using. For example, data coming out of service now kind of more or less looks the same. I wish I could say the same thing about Salesforce. Salesforce is a very different animal, but if you look at Jira, if you look at service now, or like an HR data, it, it's very much the same. And the kind of questions people want to ask is also very much the same. So we are taking our modeling language TML and building content around these things that we're calling smart apps. But essentially, if you have the right schema or roughly the right schema, then 
you just layer it on top of data sitting in Snowflake or somewhere and the boom, it goes. So this part right now is mostly created manually. There's no machine learning involved and there's no modeling involved. But I could see a time where it would make sense where some consenting customers would say, fine, you can take my data and make the thing more smarter for everyone, including me, and then we can go there. The thing I'm thinking of as you talk about AI in business intelligence is that there's this swirling conversation about bundling and unbundling in the modern data stack. And we were talking before about anomaly detection. How do you spot something that's anomalous and then maybe you send a Slack message and somebody clicks in and views the anomaly. There are entire companies being founded around just exclusively anomaly detection. One of the things that is interesting about what you're saying is that if you start to apply AI ML to the insight generation process for real, which is by and large not done today. Like take your pick of like your insight generation system and it's the human generating the insight. But the minute that you start to include AI ML in that in that process, you have a reason to stop unbundling everything into these smaller and smaller chunks of functionality. Do you have thoughts around what the appropriate edges are of quote unquote ABI tool, regardless <laughs> Who even knows what that means anymore? It, at least the, the definition of BI tool that I like <laughs> is something that everyone can use. And you don't need kind of a PhD in machine learning or years of experience in machine learning to be able to use. There are ways of exposing these kinds of algorithms to people so that it, it makes sense to them. It kind of makes the natural sense. I was talking to Ken Roden, who heads growth for us previously, he used to head growth at Google and Facebook. And he had a very interesting quote that I know lots of algorithm, the most useful algorithm I know is division. <laughs> and the point he was making was that revenue per user number, like activation per user and things like these are really the most important things that you need to know. Now, there are many things that you can divide one by the other and produce rubbish. So the smarts comes from knowing what should you be looking at? What should you be dividing with what? And that stuff can all be black boxy. But once you produce something, if it's meaningful and it's easily understood, that can have a lot of impact. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's the way I think about BI tools that you could have a lot of smartness inside, but when it comes and talks to you, it should talk to you without assuming any background. Whereas if you go to a tool like you know, Data Robot or Data IQ, they're designed for people who understand what a neural network is and what AUC curve means and things like that. And then that should be there. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting thought, interesting because the premise of AI is it learns the context as it yeah. continues to be used. And, and so the same insights are relevant in generating a chart and generating a, an alert. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, well, as long as you create the right patterns for the AI to learn and be insightful and you give it feedback, so it continues to get adapted to be smarter and smarter, could it be, you know, not just BI, but also some kind of an observability tool potentially? Could it be a completely different industry app where there's some insight that you're going to get from this AI engine on top of yeah. data? I think the problem is like, that's a little bit likely to be pie in the sky at the moment for what? AI can do, but the, I mean, the thing that this makes me think about is like, do you want to expose some of these smarts to other products so that they can kind of take advantage of them? And then you you mentioned spot apps. Do I have that name right? Yeah. Are these built by you or built by other companies? Both. Okay. It's kind of like starting a marketplace. So right now we are doing a lot of seeding, but we hope that it becomes kind of a marketplace where people can bring in their own logic. And mm, very cool. You deal with the very largest customers in the world. You have lots of Fortune 500 companies like GlaxoKleinSmith, Medtronic, Capital One, Walmart. And so the scale of data at these companies is enormous. The number of people interacting with data is many. And often there's like this challenge between accessibility and security and data is never sitting in one place. There are all these very unique complexities when you're talking about data at the very largest of enterprises. What do you think really stands out for very large companies dealing with data? Like, are there problems unique or different? And then two is supposing the promise of thought spot of, you know, you can make all employees data analysts or get insights. How does the organization get transformed? Before I answer the question, could I take a minute to clear something up? Yeah. I think there's a little bit of a misconception out there that ThoughtSpot is mostly for large companies. 
And it's mostly kind of a historic reason. So when we were getting started, there was no Snowflake. There was no GBQ and things like that. And for our hypothesis to work, we needed a really, really fast database. And so what we ended up building was a really powerful distributed in-memory database that still works in a lot of banks in different places on-prem. When somebody like Wells Fargo or somebody like an Apple started using Podspot, they needed to move terabytes and terabytes of data into our distributed in-memory database and then layer Podspot on top of it. And that was primarily the reason why we ended up going to most of the large enterprises. But as we've started partnering with Snowflake and uh, Google BigQuery and Databricks, now what we're finding is that startups are the fastest growing segment for us. And a lot of times people are using it for internal use, but they're also using it for uh, embedding and improving their product itself. So when they're exposing analytics to their customers. So I just wanted to make sure that your listeners don't walk away with the impression that ThoughtSpot is mostly for large up. So, so coming back to your question, I think um, what has happened is that the modern cloud technologies have been adopted by you know, smaller agile companies a lot more and a lot faster than the bigger companies. And what these bigger companies over the last couple of years have realized is that that's where they need to go. So when I talk to a large bank or when I talk to a large retailer, what they're saying is that we've stopped building stuff on prem. We have, we have a lot of stuff on prem and I cannot move it overnight, but that's where I need to go. Maybe in two years, maybe in five years, I'm going to shut down my data centers and I'm, I'm going to be completely in cloud. So as I build new stuff, I need to build things there. But then the challenge is that half of the data is sitting on prem and half, mm-hmm. a tiny sliver of that data has moved on to cloud. So that's one big challenge that I see that's different between small companies and big companies. Um, and then you rightly pointed about sort of security and governance and things like that are a much bigger deal and, and did a lot more stakeholders for everything. Right? So, so it's, it's just harder to get decisions done and move fast for those organizations um, because there's so many stakeholders involved in each one. But even um, security and um, compliance, what I'm seeing happening is that the small Silicon Valley startups or even mid-sized startups they're all selling to these enterprises. And now these enterprises are forcing these companies to adopt the same high standard for security and compliance that they had. And so you cannot even sell to a smallish startup, a series B startup today, without having the right security and compliance in place. Um, talk about convincing the security team to use a product. I think the hardest one by far for us was actually Snowflake. <laughs> their security team is both amazing and in many ways ruthless about what they <laughs> care about and, and to convince them they should allow you to have your data and index it and things like that was really something to watch and get amazed by and the result of once you've done the hard work of getting into these larger organizations or you've figured out how to deal with maybe complex setups on-prem, off-prem, on-prem, on-cloud, what is the result? Do people's work fundamentally change? What's the vision? Is the time spent with the data team going to be focused on other activities now that more of your organization can be data analysts themselves and explore their own data? Yeah, both of these things are happening. What I see is the time to make decision and the agility with which you can make decision goes down dramatically. It's no longer the case that you were sitting in a meeting and some question came up and then you said, okay, we'll come back next week. And then we'll ask the data team to bring back the data and then we'll look at it. You just kind of open it up right there and look at it. One of the, probably you'll know what it is, the the most iconic technology companies in the Valley, known for kind of a very strong central leadership. What their culture is like is that the mid-level managers come to the meeting and they get drilled and drilled and drilled by the leadership about like every aspect of their job, every possible data from operations. And what they used to do was essentially 
literally print out 70 pages of charts <laughs> and go to the meeting and someone asks the question, they're flipping through pages, pages and trying to answer the question. And, and so, so all of that transforms into, okay, here's the data. You have a new question, let's turn down here kind of thing. And, and what's happening to the data teams is that they are now able to engage in much more meaningful long-term value things. So, so one of the things that I routinely see is when we go to a company, somebody or the other will have this kind of question that, are you trying to take away my job? Or are you trying to replace part of my job? And what ends up happening after deployment is that they actually get promoted because now they're able to attach themselves to much higher value work and be more strategic. So I, does that answer your question? Yeah, or? no, that certainly does. I think it's twofold. You now can do just in time insight or the time to value of like figuring something interesting about your data goes way down. And that's exactly what you want for an organization because otherwise you're just like pre computing a lot of different analyses and hoping that's the one thing that matters when likely a lot of it goes to waste. And then the second one is, you know, I did a lot of AI investing in my past and that would always be like a big question of like, is AI coming for your job? And it's like, well, people used to fear the ATM would go after banks and you would no longer have bank tellers. And it's yeah. you know, true, we have fewer, but they go on and do other different kinds of work. And we evolve the kinds of problems that we have as an industry. I think people are okay for it. And so it's the same thing here. It's moving up the stack. How do you create tools to do the more rote work, the work that's not as glamorous, then people can go spend their time really investing in the things that they're uniquely great at, which could be any of a thousand things. This was really fun. I think we're going to ask our wrap-up question that we asked to all our guests. Looking 10 years out, what do you hope will be true of the data industry? I think 10 years feels like a long time, <laughs> but it's really the 10 years, it's just time enough for one or two generations of technology to come on board and then mature. So what I feel that the kinds of things that we're seeing today, just kind of in a very nascent stage, um, these transformer models really doing a good job of understanding and extracting information from text. And these things will mature. And uh, I think we will all be, I think the right phrase I'm looking for is that the fear of playing with data completely goes away. And it just comes naturally to everyone, just like mm. everyone is using email today without thinking about it twice. Everyone will be using data without thinking about it twice. The other thing that's slightly tangential to this is I feel that at a personal level, so right now when you talk about data, most of it is about enterprises and large organization, or organizations, which is generating a lot of data and people are consuming it. But even at a personal level, I feel that in 10 years, there'll be so much data all of us will be generating and it'll be meaningful and useful data mm -hmm. that we'll be using. Um, I, I see all these innovations happening in the bios space where you can track your glucose all the time. You can track your heart all the time and a bunch of other things. And there's real value in that data. So hopefully data becomes not just an enterprise thing, but something for people to use to better their own lives. All right. Thanks so much for joining us. We're going to need to do another hour at some point because we didn't even get into metrics and semantic layers and SQL generation <laughs> and all of it, hopefully for another time. Uh, we've been talking a lot about ThoughtSpot. Obviously, you can go to ThoughtSpot.com to learn about the product, but where can folks go to find out more about you and your thoughts? I'm new to this Substack. <laughs> <laughs> Is there more coming? Yeah, yeah. I was really glad to see the first couple of episodes resonate well. So I think I'm going to keep writing a little bit more and posting it on LinkedIn or Twitter. What's the address, the URL of your Substack? I think it's Prakash A1 or something like that. I All right, we'll put it in the show notes, but definitely subscribe. I prioritize them in my inbox when they come out. Thank you so much. You've been so kind and generous. So I really wanted to thank you for both your comments and inviting me over here. The Analytics Engineering Podcast is sponsored by DBT Labs and is hosted by Tristan Handy and myself, Julia Schottenstein. Have comments, questions, or guest suggestions? Email us at podcast at dbtlabs.com. Our producers are Jeff Fox and David Krevitt. If you enjoy the show, please drop a review or share it with a friend. 
Thanks for listening.